Okay, all right. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Catherine Johnston from Columbia University. Um, so I should say that, which I found out from her, that an interesting fact about her was that while she was a graduate student at Santa Cruz, uh, she was apparently one of Lars's first ever PhD students. Um, and then, so following that, um, she is uh, she then went on to the IS for a postdoc, became an associate professor at Wesleyan University, and is now here in Columbia, uh, not here in Columbia, there at Columbia, I suppose. Um, and so she's an expert in all things to do with the Milky Way. Um, and without further ado, I will let her start. Great. So uh, as always, it's really nice to be here at the CFA. Thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to see uh, friends and colleagues in the audience. Um, uh, so what I want to talk about today is um, my perspective on some work that, um, from my perspective at least, um, has I've been involved with and my group's been involved with a lot over the last decade. Um, and it's going to be my perspective, although um, there are uh, other groups working on similar topics. Um, but I, I really enjoy this story, so I hope you do too, because for myself it started um, in a direction I wasn't expecting it to and has gone in directions that I didn't expect it to. Um, and for me, it's offering at least myself some new insight into some fairly classic problems, um, some of which Lars was actually working on when uh, I was a graduate student, this key to. Um, and the formation of the stellar halo, that's a, uh, an old, a very old problem. Um, but anyway, the starting point uh, for this work was really looking at substructure in the halo. And this is an image from below curve at all, but since um, uh, Anna's in the audience, let's use this image of the uh, slow indigenous sky survey. And the point, of course, is that the stellar halo uh, is filled with structure, and I've, I've spent a long time uh, thinking about streams of stars since my graduate degree, in fact, and it was Lars who said I should study the disruption of satellites for my degree, so it's all his fault. Um, uh, but today, uh, so this is showing the stellar halo and showing you it's richly substructured, right? Um, today I want to concentrate on um, uh, these features. This is actually towards the galactic disk plane. So these, uh, I'll refer to these as low latitude structures, meaning that they're at low galactic latitude um, and somewhat aligned with the disk plane of our galaxy. So when I say low latitude though, I should be clear, I'm talking about 30 degrees, B of 30, not B of two or three. B of 30 degrees, and in particular, we're going to talk a lot about structure towards the anti-center <coughs> of the galaxy. So this is looking out from the galactic center and up in the sky at about um, 30 degrees or even higher, and below the disk as well. Um, so in this image, this is from Sloan, what you're seeing is what's called the Monopsis ray, or the giant anti-center stellar structure. Um, and these, um, this structure was first discovered back in the early 2000s, both in Sloan by Newberg et al. and Yanni et al. and also in N giant stars. And that's what we're going to concentrate on talking about today. So uh, just a broad outline so we know where we're going. Um, I know this is the theory seminar, and I think of myself as a theorist, but actually half the talk's going to be on observations. Uh, outrageous. Uh, so the first part's going to be on observations of the disk halo interface, this anti-center region in particular. And uh, then there'll be a, a, a section on formation mechanisms, what could have caused these structures. And then uh, some philosophical discussion of implications for some of these classic problems. So the starting point for me in this journey um, was looking at these low latitude structures. As I've already pointed out, um, uh, gas and the monoceros ring were discovered uh, uh, early in the last decade in Sloan and in M giant stars. Um, and uh, also fairly early in the last decade, in M giant stars, Roger Pinto actually found some more distant structures. Uh, this is beyond the limit of what Sloan could detect uh, because of the magnitude limit. Um, so if you looked in M giant stars, selected from the two micron or all sky surveys, so these are Medwich stars, and if you select them from two mass, you can get a fairly pure sample, and you can get rough distance estimates. So what Roger Pinto found is that if you look below the galactic disk plane, so here's the galactic disk plane, here's the anti-center at 180, here's 180 degrees, here's the anti-center, um, and you look below the galactic disk plane, he found this over-density of stars. And this was at distances which would put the stars beyond 
gas and the rhinoceros ring. And gas and the rhinoceros ring themselves are already right at the outskirts of what believed was the end of the stellar disk at that point. And so if you look at the scale of this, this is going down to minus 40 degrees, and it's spanning sort of 100 degrees in galactic longitude. Um, if you do an automatic uh, group finder uh, on, if you apply an automatic group finder, this is what Sanjeev Sharma did in 2010, to the entire two-mass catalog of N-giant stars. You can put up, pull up a variety of structures, and I'm pointing one other one out. This one is north, it's on the north side here, so let's see if we can put it here. This is 140 degrees, so uh, this is up here. This is where A13 would be. And this is also slightly different from gas, uh, di more distant from gas and from one. So what you should be seeing here is basically this idea that there are structures roughly parallel to our galactic disk at distances beyond where we expect them for the galactic disk, um, which potentially puts them in the halo. So indeed, the first models uh, that were run to try and explain this structure, so this is an old plot from Jorge Penarubia, where he was trying to explain the structures you see in the direction of the anti-center, at the time it was gas and one, um, using a, a disrupted satellite model. And indeed, I've written papers, this one with Alison Sheffield, where I've run simulations to model these structures as disrupted satellites, debris from disrupted satellites. Um, so actually, indeed, this is exactly where my participation in this came in. Precisely this paper uh, from Sanjeev Sharma, I'm on this paper, and we wrote, he wrote the group finder as a postdoc with me. Um, and he uncovered these structures around the galaxy in M giants, and some of them new, some old. A13 was a new one. So at about that point, I started a campaign with Steve Majeski, with Alison Sheffield, with Sanjeev Sharma, to go and get radial velocities for these substructures. And we were particularly interested, more generally in the halo, at things that looked, did not look like streams of stars, but nevertheless, we were assuming, honestly, we were assuming this was satellite debris, debris from the uh, disruption of satellites. Uh, so that campaign is what's been going on for the last six, seven years. And this is a list of um, the various papers uh, restricted to my group at this point um, and collaborators uh, with uh, my group, starting from the structure A13 that Sanji had found and also encompassing the triad one and triad two clouds. So, me, yes? Just for those who are less familiar, could you send it to about the distance scale? Uh, you didn't actually specify. Uh, how far you away they are? Was, yes. The I'm about to show you. Yes, great question, <laughs> Steve. Um, so the follow-up that I, I'm just going to go through um, bit by bit. First of all, um, we looked at radio velocities and metallicities for the m giants in all of the structures we selected. Um, and we've got papers from Alison Sheffield and a summary from Ting Lee um, that I'll be showing you data from. We've also looked at our alliances in these structures um, to try and understand, uh, to get their distances more precisely. Um, there's a paper about to come out led by Maria Bergman where we looked at abundance patterns in these structures and uh, Sherman Laporte over here has been running simulations that, uh, uh, to try and understand the formation of these structures. And if you want a summary of this, I wrote a summary with Adrian Price Whelan and most of the people on this page over the summer uh, which tries and puts this together into one picture. Um, but I'm showing you uh, 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 various people on the team who've come through Columbia as postdocs. Uh, there's three postdocs, grad students. Andy is an undergraduate student now working on this. So for myself, it's been really fun to see the connections from different parts of this project coming together. So okay, so let's go back to this question of where exactly these uh, objects are. And I'm going to do this by showing you um, where the M giants are that we targeted in our spectroscopic survey. Um, and first of all, a map on the sky, so here's the anti-center. The red points are the giant anti-center stellar stream or the rhinoceros ring, the same thing. So these are targets. It's not, we didn't get all the M giants in this, but these are targets that we followed up with spectroscopy uh, in, green, in uh, red. In blue, these are uh, all the targets uh, from Sanjeev's um, A13 group of M giants. And we got all the uh, spectra uh, of all the M giants in that group. And then we also got spectra of all the M giants in the Triand uh, region, Triangle Andromeda region. So this is where those targets are on the sky. Um, with M giants, you have rough distances. 
So you can actually project this down. So this is what Ting Li did. She consolidated the data set that we've collected over the years. And this is showing you projected down on the plane of the sky, on the plane of the galaxy. Here's the sun, here's the center of the galaxy. This shows you where uh, these features are. So here's uh, gas and monoceros. And then um, uh, A13 is in the blue, it's more distant. And then the green and the pink are trion one and trion two. And the point here is traditionally the end of the galactic disk is thought to be about 15 kpc. We're going out to 25 or even 30 kpc from the center of the galaxy here uh, when we're looking at these targets. Um, the other thing I should note, of course, here is the uh, uh, errors on the distances are huge, of order 20% or so. So um, you should think of these distances as really rough, but you can nevertheless see there is a separation in distance here. So the key point is you're going out a long way from the galactic center. Um, I should also note for Triant, we split it into what we're calling Triant 1 and Triant 2. And this actually comes back uh, to some work by uh, uh, Nicola Maltin from 2007 where he uh, reported what he saw as two main sequences in the foreground of the PANDAS survey towards Andromeda, and he related these as, as being seen as two rings here. Our distance errors are big enough that we cannot resolve those rings, and it's not completely clear that they are rings, but potentially these are all separate features in distance as well. Okay, so this, hopefully this answers your question in terms of in the plane. To give you a sense of scale, though, you, I should really put this up to show you this cartoon. I think it's a NASA cartoon to show our galaxy, to give you a sense of scale, that these are way beyond, especially the outskirts, are way beyond where we expect uh, the end of our galactic disk. The other sense you should give, remember, I'm showing you the projection onto the disk plane, but these are also at uh, up to 30 or even 40 degrees above the plane. So this is now plotting X versus Z, and this is giving you uh, stars that are distances of plus or minus 10, up to plus or minus 10 kpc and beyond uh, the plane of the galaxy. Okay. Uh, which is why the first models that we ran, ran for this were assuming that these stars were part of the halo, and these, this was a signature of a disrupt, the substructure was a signature of a disrupted satellite. Okay, so in space, you've got the idea that uh, far out and the very far from the plane of the galaxy. If we look at the velocities, so this is plotting the velocities as a function of galactic longitude, so going round from here all the way round on, as a function of longitude. These are far from the plane, but nevertheless, you can see a single sequence uh, go, uh, with a, a steady gradient going from plus 100 to minus 100 line of sight velocity as you go around. And uh, what you're seeing in uh, yellow and in cyan is showing you um, if you took stars moving at, I can't remember exactly, this will be roughly 200 kilometers per second, and project them out to these distances, what would you see in terms of line of sight velocity? So what you should see here is a single sequence that spreads across all of these groups, even though they're disjoint um, uh, spatially. And secondly, you should see that the dispersion here is of order sort of 50 kilometers per second or even less. The dispersion of, uh, of uh, random objects in the halo should be of order 120 kilometers per second. So this is a relatively small dispersion um, across these groups as well. Okay, so so far we've got that distant in space, but they have coherent velocity, a coherent trend in velocity, and they have similar velocity dispersions. Right? So that's velocities in space. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more carefully about space because um, these distance errors are so huge, it's really hard to tell exactly where they, where they are, right? So at this point, when we've got the data this far, um, we decided, well, we may be able to build a more careful model of how these um, structures originated, um, uh, the origin of these structures, by finding the distances more accurately. So Adrian Price Whalen, who was at the time a graduate student at Columbia, had the bright idea, um, let's use some of our local observing time, and he wanted to get some observing experience. Anyway, I will go, he's, he volunteered, I'll go and get radial velocities for uh, our Alari stars in the region. And what we'll do is we'll match the, uh, the velocity trend we see in the MJETs with the velocity trend we see in the Alari, and we'll get accurate distance measurements, and then we'll be able to build this fabulous model of the entire structure. 
So this is showing you the data we had at the time. This was for, N, uh, for the Trian 1 and Trian 2 structures. So this is the same velocity trend I showed you last time, including some outlying stars. So these are all spectra of N giants as a function of L, the velocity trend. Um, and uh, Adrian went to get spectra of the RLI uh, in the region, and this is what he found. So this is repeating for you the M giants, and the black are the spectra of the RLI. So this was um, about three years ago. Um, I remember distinctly sitting in my office with Adrian and with Allison and looking at this and saying, well, is it worth publishing a null result? Because we haven't found any RLI, and we can't measure distances, so our experiment has failed. And then we sat there, and it took us like 15, 20 minutes, and we started realizing that actually this was actually far more interesting than having the experiment work. Um, and why is it interesting? Um, you have to start thinking about what type of stars M giants are and what type of stars RLI are. Um, basically, RLI um, come from old and metal poor populations. So just to show you an example, here's a 10 gig year old isochrome. Um, oh, this is from um, the Padua group, the Padua isochrome group. Um, so here's a 10 gig year old isochrome, a metal core one, FE over H of minus two. And I've shown you, uh, this is a color magnitude diagram. Here's the instability strip. Uh, this isochrome clearly will have our lyrics associated with it. This population would have our lyrics associated with it. But if you look at a more metal rich yet old population, FE over H of minus one, you can see in the red that this would not have our lyrics associated with it. On the other hand, if you go back to the metal core population, this is the color range of the spectral classification of M giant stars. So you can see the metal core population would have no RLIs associated with it. And the metal, uh, sorry, no M giants associated with it. And the metal rich population, it has no RLIs, but it does have M giants associated with it. So if we go back here, what we could see this now, instead of thinking this as a failed experiment for measuring distances to these structures, we instead repurpose it into a stellar population study, which is telling you that whatever made this population of M giants has to have been metal rich enough to have M giants, but have no metal pool population that contains our alliance. Um, so uh, Adrian price did this, is, um, uh, this uh, uh, analysis much more carefully with a mixed a mixture model of um, a Gaussian mixture model to model the background halo and the foreground that we're seeing with the mean trend and asked what is the limit we can give on F which is the ratio of RLIs to N giant stars that we see in our structure and these are the um, uh, final probability distributions for what he was finding for uh, this ratio given the data that we found so you can see that it's uh, peaked to around zero and it goes up to a possible ratio of about 0.5 um, because we have small numbers of targets, we can't constrain it more tightly than that. So what we did to understand this in terms of the populations we look around the Milky, uh, for the Milky Way is we compared this to the other satellites in the Milky Way or um, satellites in the Milky Way which mostly don't contain any M giant stars. They do have our alignment populations but they don't have M giant stars. So those would have infinite ratios, basically. The uh, only ones that do have um, both M giants and RLIs are the largest ones because they have both metal rich and metal poor populations. This statement is about the satellites mostly not having metal rich populations. So the LMC and Sagittarius, uh, we actually uh, calculated a ratio, estimated very roughly a ratio for RLIs to M giants, and we got a number of about 0.5. And that's a statement about them having a mixture of populations, right? But for the galactic disk, the galactic disk has little or no RLIs, and it has large populations of M-chains. So what we concluded from this is this uh, set of substructures that we've been assuming were disrupted satellites actually had stellar populations that made them look like the disk. And just to remind you, this is at distances of up to 30 kpc from the center of the Milky Way and up to 10 she's down for Trian 1 and 2, 10 kpc below the plane of the Milky Way. So we published a paper talking about this, and we were um, really excited about this result, despite the fact that our original experiment had failed. 
And we have since followed up for A13 and for Gas and Monoceros. And Alison's just putting a paper, has just submitted a paper that shows we get very similar results for A13 and for Monoceros and Gas as well. Okay, <clears throat> so the last thing I want to show you before summarizing this section on observations is um, the other thing you can do to understand associations uh, in the Milky Way, um, apart from just looking at broad stellar populations, is to look at abundance patterns. So um, uh, our advisor on the RLI would work, our external advisor was Branimir Cesar. So Branimir Cesar um, uh, 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 started the collaboration with Maria Bergman to um, go and look at abundance patterns to uh, confirm that the sort of stellar populations work we were doing um, actually made sense in terms of the abundance patterns. So Maria Bergman um, is just publishing a paper on this. This is also uh, in the review stage at the moment. Um, and this is showing you the chemical abundance patterns for a set of, I think it's 13 stars. This is showing you the average and the dispersion for a set of 13 stars that we found both in A13 and Monoceros and gas. Um, and um, um, the black point is our data, and these are various abundance, uh, abundances, so oxygen, europium, magnesium, and sodium versus metal SD. Um, and these are for the N giant stars again, but high resolution detailed abundances. The gray is for thickest stars, the pattern that we see in thickest stars. And the blue is for the Fornax dwarf spheroidal galaxy, and the green is for the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal galaxy. So our conclusion from this is also that the abundance patterns are more consistent with a disk origin than an origin in satellite. So in summary, we started off on this uh, journey in, back in 2010, want, wanting to study uh, debris in the halo of our galaxy. And our conclusion is that we failed um, because what we found was in velocities, we found a continuous sequence across multiple groups uh, as a continuous velocity dis sequence with low dispersion. We could reproduce this caref very carefully, probably, with a satellite, destroyed satellite. However, none of the satellites in the Milky Way that we see today, um, uh, uh, all of, sorry, put it a different way, all of the satellites in the Milky Way that we see today have associated our Larry stars, and we couldn't find associated our Larry stars, and moreover, the structures we're seeing have thick disk abundances. So our conclusion is uh, that all these different pieces, gas, mon, triand, and A13, are all associated with each other, but they're also associated with the galactic disk. And so we're now seeing stars in the galactic disk at vast distances and very high above and below the plane of the galaxy. Um, so that um, is my personal perspective on uh, my understanding of uh, the observations as they came together. Even though we were trying to drive this in a different direction, it's been really fun to be proved wrong by your own work. I think that's the first time I published one paper saying one thing and the next paper actually saying, well, that was completely wrong. Uh, that's really fun. Um, but we're not the only ones who've been working on related things, so I wanted to mention a couple of other things. Here's a cartoon, and um, Adrian would actually not want me to show you this cartoon, um, because it, it, it doesn't leave you the best picture, but um, in the simulations you'll see uh, a better idea. But this is, a, to me, this summarizes the data really well uh, in a cartoon fashion, as long as you don't take it too literally. So here we are at the sun, and we're looking out through the galaxy, and these uh, features are all at different distances. They're also at different azimuths, which is why this cartoon's a little misleading. But basically, you can see Monoceros um, uh, or the giant or gas peaking down below the plane of the galaxy and then at larger distance above the plane of the galaxy. And then you run into Triand 1, and then you run into A13, and then you run into Triand 2. Um, the distances, as I said, aren't measured very well. This is why this is somewhat misleading, but it nevertheless gives you a sort of overview of what we were seeing in our studies. On top of that, um, there have now been measurements of proper motions of stars in gas that show that they're rotating with the galactic disk. And many of the satellite models had the satellite having to be on a retrograde orbit, at least my satellite models. So this is good. Um, with, this confirms the disk association. And the other thing that's fun is locally, people have started to see indications that the disk plane is not uh, sitting uh, uh, symmetrically and carefully about the mid, what we're defining as the mid plane. 
Um, so you actually see some asymmetries in the velocity distribution very locally close to the sun. This has uh, been seen in Sloan and it's also been seen in Wave, Wave, Rave. If you look slightly outwards from the sun in Lemos, you can actually trace this and see asymmetries in the velocity distribution in the disk above and below the plane going out a few kpc from the sun. We haven't gone too far yet. And so you can actually start thinking about the whole disk as being shaken with uh, disturbances um, or be, that you can trace all the way to the sun and going all the way out to uh, rather large distances. Okay, <clears throat> so um, by about two years ago, um, our studies had proceeded far enough that I was becoming very interested in uh, thinking about, in fact the whole group were interested in, thinking about how you can make stars in the disk transition um, so that they look spatially as if they're part of the halo. Um, and of course the obvious way to do that is to hit a disk with a satellite galaxy. So here's a simulation by Sherwin Laporte. Luckily for us, Sherwin Laporte joined our group at about that time and we persuaded him to move from running simulations of clusters to running sim simulations of satellites hitting disks. And uh, actually, grad students working with Lars while I was a grad student were running similar simulations, so hopefully uh, this is kind of fun um, to revisit this. Um, but let me show this once again. This is an animation made by uh, our undergraduate student, by the way. Um, but yes, of course, if you have a satellite come around and hit a disk, it can do, do all sorts of nasty stuff to the disk. So the trick um, uh, that we wanted to do was to uh, look at existing satellites around the Milky Way and understand their influence. And also we needed to be able to kick material as far out as possible while at the same time not disturbing the galactic disk too much because the disk still does exist, right? So it was a sort of sanity check to ask if we can, using satellites that we know, create um, material at the, uh, by kicking out the disk at the sort of distances that we were seeing while still maintaining a reasonable disk. Um, before we get going, I should uh, go backwards and point out that of course this is a, a topic that's been, uh, has a long history. Um, and so there's uh, many references here, and I'm missing some towards the end, um, of people who've looked at this before. And the basic um, uh, physics that I've learned from uh, these studies to expect is um, that when you think of the system, of course you should think about the satellite being influenced by the Milky Way. You should also think about the uh, uh, Milky Way being influenced uh, by the satellite. Um, but a very important point, which was first uh, really brought home to us by Martin Weinberg back in the 90s, is that um, the halo, um, dark matter halo that we don't see, it plays an equally important part here. Because the satellite going round the Milky Way is going to distort the halo, and the halo itself, that distortion, can distort the disk as well. And of course that halo distortion is what causes the satellite's orbit to change due to dynamical friction. So the bottom line is what you already know, that all masses in the universe interact with all other masses, and you have to think of all of these um, things all going on together. So I, what I want to do next is show you a few parts from Sherbin's latest paper to show you this, um, uh, to illustrate some of these ideas. Um, uh, so he's uh, now got two papers he's put together. The first one is really looking at the Large Magellanic Cloud. I'm going to concentrate more on results uh, from his second paper, which is looking at the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. And at the end, I'll show you a couple of plots, which are simulations including both the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy and the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, the basics of uh, the simulation is that it was that he ran this with a tree code. The Milky Way is represented by a bulge disk halo model um, containing tens of millions of particles, with the disk containing about five million particles. Um, I think the one important thing we found um, was that actually um, um, uh, we're using uh, Sherman was using uh, standard codes here and standard initialization codes. And one of the things he found that he had to ch change the standard initialization code to make the disk uh, extend out to 40 kpc um, in order to get particles in regions of interest to us. Uh, so uh, if you talk to people who know the Milky Way, they'll tell you, well, the disk ends at 20 kpc. So in most of the models, disks end at 20 kpc, and there are no stars beyond that. 
So actually, we, it was necessary for us to put stars beyond what is the traditional end of the galactic disk. It's still in a thin disk at the beginning of our simulations in order to match, in any sense, the observations, right? Which I think is interesting in itself. Um, uh, okay. So, but let me make a comment there, because that makes it, yes, Anna. Actually, in, in your final snapshot, is this still realized up to 40 or does it kind of come closer to that's the end of the story. Okay. Yes. Um, but I was, I should, I should say along the way, um, so I'm talking about realizing the disk beyond the edge of the galactic disk. I think you don't need a lot of stars out there. We've got, in, in the features that I'm talking about, we've got of order um, uh, tens, like 50 giant stars in each of these features spread out over a huge area of the sky. So you're talking about a very small number of stars. The reason we can even see these features is because we live in the Milky Way and we're using star count catalogs. And they haven't been seen before. Um, so uh, realizing this disk out to 40 kpc is not necessarily inconsistent with the statement that the disk ends at 20 kpc. It just means we're going to, star counts has allowed us to go to lower surface brightness, if that's making sense. Okay, good, so these, uh, this is the sort of models. For Sagittarius, uh, we modeled uh, Sagittarius with two components. Um, the dark matter mass, um, they, these were considered uh, uh, low mass and high mass models. This is quite hilarious. The models I was running as a graduate student had a Sagittarius mass, maximum of about 10 to the 9 solar masses. So uh, that's two decades ago, it's a long time ago now. But, um, but this, what you have to remember is this is the initial mass of the dark matter halo. Most of this gets stripped in the first passage, which is nowhere near where Sagittarius is today. So modeling. Uh, the core today is a different statement from what is the initial mass of the object that fell in. Um, so the dark matter masses of these objects of um, light and heavy of uh, uh, 6 times 10 to the 10 to 1 times 10 to the 11. Um, the other thing, we actually ran four models, um, uh, two which we called high density models, so high concentration models, and two which we called low density models, so basically lower concentration models. In each we put um, a stellar mass component um, of much smaller scale um, with a border 6 times 10 to the 8 solar masses in stellar mass. And there were order of a million particles in the Sagittarius um, uh, models. The important thing to note here is, um, I think, which is a difference from previous simulations, is that um, uh, Sherman was careful to figure out how to put the models starting at the virial radius of the Milky Way. So if you look here, there's a little black line here. This is showing you uh, some previous models run by Chris Purcell, um, which are some really great models um, of Sagittarius uh, falling in. But he started those models with Sagittarius at about 80 kpc and ran them for a few giga years. So we explored further back with Sagittarius falling in all the way from the radial radius, um, running for about uh, six giga years or so. And what you're seeing here in the blue and the red, the L means the light model, and the H means the heavy model, um, and the, oh, let me see if we get this the right way around. Um, uh, and, sorry, the blue is the, um, uh, uh, the low density model, and the red is the high density model. Am I saying that the right way around? Right, so this is the light model, and this is the heavy model. The red, should be able to tell this, because the red, is going to hold on to mass more, so it's going to sink faster. Right, so the red is the more concentrated model because it's sinking faster. Right. Uh, so the blue model is going to lose more mass and we'll end up with less mass at the end of the simulation. Okay. But the key point here is the satellite orbit starts out at the period radius. Now, if we go back to some of the physics here, we can actually have a look at what's going on in the dark matter halo. And this is just showing you for uh, one model, which it, it is the heavy, most massive model. So it's the most extreme case. And this is showing you, this is today at the end of our simulation. And this is four giga years ago. It's showing you the, uh, at a shell of 30 kpc, uh, what uh, was the halo like. This is in uh, the angular coordinates in the shell. And it's showing you the deviations from the mean density of that shell. And you can see, even four giga years ago, that's two giga years after the simulation started, but way before Sagittarius is impacting close to the galactic center, you're getting uh, uh, density variations of order 30%. Um, and if you look then um, in this shell, 
if you look then closer in, this is an 8 kpc, the, it takes longer for the halo to respond closer in. Sagittarius is coming in from a large distance. But as Sagittarius gets closer, you also get large disturbances in the inner halo uh, due to Sagittarius passage. So you can think of Sagittarius, um, uh, this is the point that Sagittarius, the response to the disc to Sagittarius um, is actually two responses, one directly to Sagittarius itself and the other one to the halo. So Sherman made this great plot to show you what the torque on the disc is, uh, summed and average, summed over the disc, what is the torque on the disc due to the dark matter halo wake, that's in black, and then due to the direct <coughs> impact of Sagittarius itself. And marked here are the pericentric passages. So this is 50 kpc, 30, 15, and 10 for this model. And what you can see is a lovely transition from where uh, Sagittarius is coming in, but all of the action is actually due, and it's as big as the action at the end. All of the talk of the disc early on is due to the uh, disturbance to the halo, not directly from Sagittarius. And it's only when Sagittarius gets to points where it's actually directly impacting the disc that the disturbance due to Sagittarius becomes the most important. Um, so let's see, we're doing okay on time. Good. So um, I just want to show you a couple more slides to give you a flavor for the sort of responses we're getting. Um, um, so this is showing you for our models. This is the light low density model, the light high density model, the heavy low density model, and the heavy high density model. And you can see as it makes most sense, the heavy high density model, which is the one that has the largest final mass, uh, creates the greatest response, right? And on this, uh, on this image, this is the center of the galaxy, the sun sits about here, so the anti-center is out in this direction. And the region that we're looking at in our surveys is this region of the galaxy around here. And what you're supposed to get from this image is not that you see beautiful concentric rings necessarily, <coughs> but you see oscillations above and below the plane of the galaxy um, with large amplitude here. This is the mean height at these different positions in the galaxy. So if we hit uh, uh, the galaxy with a large enough object um, on an orbit rather like the Sagittarius dwarf, you can get the response from the disk. I forgot to say something rather important here, which is, of course, we also did our best to at least qualitatively in terms of order of magnitude, match the uh, observations of the dwarf itself. So at the point where it's hitting the disk, it's lost enough material that um, the velocity dispersion uh, of the object itself is of order 15 to 20, 20 kilometers per second. And the tails from the object, the stars that have been stripped off, stretch around the galaxy at similar positions to Sagittarius itself, and they have a similar width. Um, in order to make that work, you do have to embed the stars deep within the dark matter halo so that uh, you get the right um, scales. Okay, um, good. So this is showing you, in general, we're at the right order of magnitude. The last thing uh, to note here is the solid circle is the solar circle. So the sun sits here, right? I probably pointed to the wrong place before. The solid circle is the solar circle. Um, uh, so the sun sits here, and you're not seeing a huge response here. We did also check in velocity as well. Uh, so you do see a, a small asymmetry at the solar circle, which is order of magnitude, what is actually detected in Sloan as well. Uh, so we are able to disturb the outer disk without, uh, while still keeping a uh, uh, fairly stable inner disk. So the last things I wanted to do for this portion of the talk was actually show you um, a comparison um, uh, to the M giant data. And I just wanted to say before showing you that comparison that when, um, to be clear, what we're uh, aiming at here is order of magnitudes um, uh, and uh, general characteristics and features rather than an exact match. Because the nature of the simulation being fully self-consistent makes it pretty much impossible to exactly match uh, everything. Uh, getting all the velocity trends, etc. So the aim here was to ask if an object uh, rather like Sagittarius or an orbit rather like Sagittarius impacting a Milky Way rather like our Milky Way can produce features rather like the ones we see versus matching things exactly. So what you're seeing here um, is galactic longitude, galactic latitude, um, over density looking in particular we're interested towards the anti-center here. This is the region. 
fall off four different models. So the low, dense, um, the low mass models and the high mass models. And you can see that um, the low mass Sagittarius model doesn't produce too much of a response. And of course, this high mass, highest endpoint mass also, produces the highest response. Um, and it's interesting, actually. I had a, a lot of discussion with uh, Sherman exactly how to frame it. We have two different ways of framing this. So one way would be to, see, to say, therefore, Sagittarius's mass must be this big. But actually, I, I don't necessarily see this as the answer, because Sagittarius is not the only player in the Milky Way, right? And there could be dark satellites that we don't even see. So this is saying something like Sagittarius, um, if it was this big, could alone produce this response. What the real Milky Way history is doing is, um, some, is another question. For the comparison with data, just to show you, uh, this is um, uh, the uh, uh, data um, for uh, monoxorus and gas. These are where the M giants are, just to show you that in this ring, so this is heliocentric distance uh, between 10 and 30, 13 kpc, you get material at the appropriate heights. And this is showing you at the larger distances, you can also kick out material to the appropriate regions. This is A13, and this is for Triant 1 and Triant 2. <clears throat> so our conclusion from this section, right? From the observations, we convinced ourselves that we're finding disk stars where we thought the halo was. Um, uh, from the simulations, um, you, you uh, can point to Sagittarius as playing a key role in this, although likely there's many other things going on as well that will also contribute to this. And what I wanted to spend the last five minutes or so doing was just um, uh, to have fun talking a little bit about implications, looking backwards on some problems that people have talked about um, over, the, over the years. Um, so, um, disk heating, galactoseismology, the formation of the stellar halo. So if we start um, with uh, disk heating, um, this has been something that people have been working on, as I said earlier, for um, uh, several decades. Um, and I think um, the interest in this, uh, certainly when I was a graduate student, um, my perception of, of the interest in this was in asking if you have, uh, well, there's various questions, but one question could be, we know that many galaxies have a thin and thick disk. So can you form a, a thick disk by taking a thin disk and throwing satellites at it and thicken it, thickening it to make it a, a thick disk? And so the sorts of questions you look at there are, um, uh, on average, how much heating do you get for different types of orbits and different uh, masses of satellites? Um, and what is the average structure of the disk at the beginning and end of your simulation? So the fun thing. Um, that I think is new about what we're doing, because we're really doing the same experiment only 20 years later, uh, or even 30 years later. Um, the fun thing, I think, is the type of observations we have now, specifically for the Milky Way. This is a beautiful image of the monoxorous ring in PanStars data, put together by Colin Slater. And you can see these gorgeous, fine features. Not only do you see stars kicked up to high uh, distances, uh, but you can see that uh, they exist, uh, they can exist in fairly fine features. And such features we also see in our simulations um, as signatures still of, uh, fairly clear signatures still of um, almost of individual interactions. So in a way, what, what I like to think of this is doing, oh, and here's, I have to show you another image. So this is another visualization from my undergraduate, which is showing you, uh, this was for uh, hopefully a press release at some point, which is showing you some uh, similar fine features in the simulation. So I think the interesting thing that the Milky Way is providing to, to us by allowing us to go to really low surface brightness is to allow us to look at disk heating again, revisit the question of disk heating. And instead of looking at average properties, we're actually looking at a disk heating event in process. And we're looking at, this is telling us, these features are telling us that the signatures are not completely phase mixed. And so that might allow us to learn something about more about the disk heating mechanisms uh, possibly to start uh, thinking about that halo wake more precisely. Um, uh, so it's allowing, it's this, in this sense, it's a, a new view on uh, an old problem because we're looking at it in, in progress versus just looking at the endpoints statistically. Um, so that's disk heating, one view. Um, 
The second thing, um, galactoseismology, this is a term that actually was uh, coined by Larry Widrow in some papers and also Sakyana Chakrabarti. And they were using this to say, Sakyana was actually, Sakyana was actually looking at uh, uh, the gas disk around the Milky Way. And she was looking for features in the gas disk and trying to relate those to uh, uh, known satellites and possibly finding unknown satellites. So the galactoseismology term, as I understood it, um, is used um, to, uh, is the hypothesis that if you look at features like these, that as I pointed out, uh, uh, from ongoing interactions, and they're not fully phase mixed, you can actually reconstruct something about uh, the satellite itself, uh, the history of the satellite, and the parent galaxy from looking at the um, uh, scale and uh, uh, phase and amplitudes of these features. Now, that's a bit of a stretch right now. I would say we've, we've um, uh, started trying to think about how you can start interpreting some of these individual features in the simulations and relate them back to the properties of the satellite that made them. Um, we have some hopeful plots to indicate um, uh, uh, that you uh, get different signatures from different satellites. What I'm showing you here is if you uh, take our heavy models and add an LMC-like satellite to them. This is with the LMC, this is without the LMC. You can see uh, a slight modulation of what you expect from whether you have the LMC in there or not. In general, what we're finding is um, uh, the LMC, if, um, as there has been work in this very institution showing that the LMC is on, likely on first passage with the Milky Way, if it's on a first pericenter and its pericenter is at uh, 50 kpc, it may be slightly more massive than Sagittarius was initially, but its influence is really currently still towards the outside of the disk on a rather large scale. So you're going to tend to see, if you did a Fourier decomposition, its signature will be on the outskirts of the disk with low order modes. Sagittarius has been interacting longer and has um, been dragged much further in. The signature of Sagittarius is spread all the way to the inner part of the disk, uh, even to the sun, with those small um, oscillations in velocity. And the uh, uh, wavelength, if, if you want to put it like that, uh, and also the Fourier modes associated with the Sagittarius disturbance are going to be higher order Fourier modes and shorter wavelengths. So this is the myth of galactic se seismology, which I hope is going to turn into uh, more than a myth that we will actually be able to separate out the signatures from the different satellites in the long run. Uh, and finally, formation of the stellar halo. Uh, so as, as um, most of you, or many of you know, I've worked on this for a long time too, and I've spent a long time dragging things into the stellar halo and disrupting them and making the stellar halo from accretion. So it's really fun to, to turn around and actually uh, look at uh, it, how much of the stellar halo we might be able to make by uh, kicking stars out of the disk. This is also something that people in this institution and elsewhere have looked at in, in simulations. The exciting thing I think about the work um, uh, that I've talked about here from us and from other groups is that we're finally getting some observational handles on how much, uh, if any, of the stellar halo may be made from kicking out the disk. For a long time this was something that was talked about in simulations but it was hard to know um, to what extent it was seen in reality. Um, and of course, um, I have to refer to, at this point, Anna's recent paper this last year using Gaia data to look at this question. So I would say uh, this, we've, um, the work that we've done on the anti-center of the Milky Way is, is showing this mechanism in process. And uh, Anna should tell you about, hey, I'll tell you, <laughs> but my version of your paper, <laughs> the quick version, is that um, if you uh, use the beautiful Gaia data set, you're able to uh, find uh, stars that are clearly in the halo because they're moving at, at uh, high velocities relative to us, and yet they're metal rich. And this is suggesting, and you can ask Alan for the longer version, that actually a surprisingly large part of the halo uh, could have actually been kicked out of the disk, meaning tens of percent, right? Tens of percent? Solar neighborhood, right? Yes, it's in the solar neighborhood, right. So I think this is, um, this is another piece of the puzzle which is actually matching up with the sort of thing that uh, we're seeing. We're looking at mechanisms and Anna's work is looking at what might have happened historically. 
The other place where this has been done uh, with some success is M31. Uh, I mean, for a decade we've known that M31 has had a vastly, when you go to very low surface brightness, you see a really messed up disk, which is essentially what we're saying about the outer disk in the Milky Way now. And Claire Dorman has done this work recently where uh, she's also found um, uh, stars um, that have kinematics like the halo, but are metal rich, uh, like the disk, looking towards M31. Um, so, um, any talk of the Milky Way has to mention Gaia, but looking at, uh, because Gaia is wonderful, but uh, looking ahead, the other exciting possibilities for expanding this to think about more statistical samples of galaxies is um, uh, imagining um, and uh, uh, what we're going to see when we look at a very low surface brightness around other galaxies. Um, so, clearly for the Milky Way, once we started looking carefully at M31, uh, not only did we find halos and substructure in the halo, we're finding extended disks and substructure in those extended disks. LSST uh, will reach to not quite the same depth, but for millions of galaxies, and W first, using star counts, will be able to do this for hundreds of galaxies. Um, and so then at that point, we can start asking more, if once we've solved the galactic seismology ideal, we may be able to ask um, more generally what these features are telling us for significant samples of galaxies. So that's it. Thanks very much. something that we would like to know. Um, my guess is that, it'll, it, because, as I tried to say earlier, my, my guess is that um, there's actually a negligible amount of material out there. You just need some material. That's, but that's, in a, um, in a way, that's the beauty of it, because uh, if, it's, if it's a negligible amount in terms of gravity, it gets kicked very easily and is a great test particle tracer for what the interaction is actually doing. So I think it's it's a my guess is a, it's a very small fraction that you need to put out there. Um, is the answer? A great model. I, I'm convinced that these oscillates in the disk must be that you know which you've shown. But um, so a comment about stellar processes can also launch stars out of the disk, so runaway star yes. mechanisms. Yes. And there's some estimate that something like 0.1% of the disk stars are runaway stars. In which case, that would be 2% of the halo in the solar system. So I think, you know, in the order of magnitude, I think it's, you can imagine multiple things coming off the disk. Yes, yes, that's, that's, that's a great point. And we, we, but we should be able to find the ones that have recently come off, right, by looking at the stellar populations. Like your sort of study, looking at blue stars. You yeah, be well, because them. stars launched from disk come from a rotating disk. Anyway, they should have an imprint in their distribution yes. that would be different from what you would find, too. Yes, yes. Good, good. I like that. Is this the models that you have that can create the groups of part of the A13 was called A13. A13 and what was the other one? Yes. yes. Um, are they all also at the point where you can make predictions where to look for fainter groups like this? Yes, now that's a great question, and I think the answer is no. Precisely because, as I tried to say, half, the big caveat is uh, having a self consistent model that actually really matches everything is very difficult. So even to get Sagittarius roughly in the right place. Is, uh, takes uh, some effort. And uh, Gatina Bez was a graduate student here, uh, did this for the LC, right? So I, th I think it's a very hard thing to do. So even that, which is just putting it in the right place, is hard. And then, then you have to have had the right history to exactly match the features. So we, I'd love to go that direction and say, be able to make predictions, but I, I'm not sure yet. But it might be worth thinking about broadly. I haven't thought really about even broadly being say something about if we look at the other side of the Milky Way we should see. Yeah. I guess we could at least say we should see similar features at this point. Oh yeah, I guess it, it doesn't way. say that these would be all. Yeah, you wouldn't expect like the other side of the Milky Way to be completely pristine. Yeah. It's not a very specific question. Yeah. 
do. How many? Yeah, I think it's usually. Sure. How many questions? <laughs> um, I will ask one though that this got me thinking about. So in Gertina's models, right, the LMC is an appreciably large thing, and it has a substantial gas component, which of course we see now. Um, so SAG today doesn't have any gas, but if it's as big as these models say it is, it probably did at the beginning. So I don't think I remember sure of saying that that was in there at this point, but but what would have happened to that? Because a lot of times in simulations I've worked in recently, you see things of about that mass where star formation is continuing as the tidal disruption begins. Um, and, and it could change, in fact, the cell populations you'd expect for, for something like this. I think that's a very good point. I hadn't thought about that at all. Because we could look, I mean, the answer is, of course, it, oh, it just gets stripped. But if there were, if you're expecting that to be star formation, you'd expect star formation as we said five eight years ago. And I, I can't remember what the star formation history of Sagittarius looks like. Because it's really broad, is why I'm asking. Yeah, so I think that might be worth going back to look at that. We should chat about yeah. this. But I want I want to caution again, like so, we've like I'm, because of my history, I think I'm a little disturbed by the huge mass of Sagittarius we've assumed here, and I know that because. Cosmologically, it does. It's not necessarily inconsistent, and it's it's not crazy. But I, I just want to point out again, it's not that these features can be created by many different things, right? So we asked a very specific question, which doesn't is not necessarily telling us what the mass of Sagittarius is. It's telling us what the mass of Sagittarius would need to be if Sagittarius was the only thing to create these features, which is a slightly different statement. So I just want to be very clear. We're not really measuring mass. I'm, you won't say that, but I'm just worried that people are going to take that as a take-home message. That's not a take-home message right now. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, if you're trying to yeah. explain this with Sagittarius, yes. and your argument rests on the stellar populations, that maybe that you have to consider. Yes, you've got some star formation history papers next time you get to Yes, yes, great. So, I mean, obviously, that's a question that we've been trying to look at with Andy, our undergrad, in the summer because Gaia is going to produce some beautiful motion maps. Um, but so far, there is one paper that's already addressing this um, from uh, uh, Thomas DeBoer and Vasily Golokarov, and Sergei Kapasov is the one who put this catalog together. And the first proper motion measurements they're making in the region, which can go out to monoceros and gas, so not the distant ones, are showing proper motion in the same. Um, as we would expect for disk rotation. Interestingly, they're finding an incredibly low, low dispersion, um, like two kilometers per second. But uh, Vasily himself, I was talking to him about the other week, this the other week, and he says he's not convinced by that measurement, but he thinks he's Exactly. Yeah, they don't exactly. have a decision to say yeah. that. But wouldn't it be fun if it was two kilometers per second, it would give us something to shoot at, <laughs> or whether they could shoot us down with it anyway. Okay, so Anna's more skeptical, but I think it's fun to see. <laughs> yeah, I'm not buying this version. Yeah, measurements. I, I wanted to tell you one more thing, which is an observational thing that doesn't make sense, uh, maybe. Uh, to, um, the abundance patterns, when you see Maria's paper come out, what you'll find is that we have 13 stars. They have, within the Arabas, the exact same abundance. That is weird. So this goes back to if these stars are in the outer disk, is this talent? What is it telling us? Because they. That sounds like a globular cluster to me, but a globular cluster shouldn't have, shouldn't have M giants, and it shouldn't be spread all over the sky. It should be a thin. So there are there are things that still need working out. But that paper should be coming out the next month, or so. and then you can all shoot it down. Yes. <laughs> Any further questions? Your last chance to ask. Okay, well, if not, let's just thank Catherine once more.